Okay. We'll call the meeting of the uh, Medina County Board of Commissioners to order. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In our prayer for the morning, Heavenly Father, we beseech your divine guidance in this meeting. Keep us ever mindful of our obligations. Grant us, dear Lord, wisdom, tolerance, and courage that we may well serve our county and fulfill our trust. Amen. Amen. So uh, first up on our agenda is uh, Grace Colucci, who is the Executive Director of NOACA. So good morning, Grace. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Hudson, Commissioner Hambly, and Commissioner Swedick, um, along with, I see, many um, of our other NOACA family. Um, Engineer Conrad, of course, who is a board member. Um, uh, Director Dentler, who is on our Business Advisory Council. And uh, Mr. Ryan, who is on our uh, Transit Council. Did I miss anybody? Patrick Patton. Oh, <laughs> I can't see you with the mask. And yes, uh, Mr. Patton, who is also um, a uh, board member. Correct. Correct. Um, so thank you very much for having me here today. Um, first, let me tell you that I appreciate very much the feedback from Medina County. Uh, we are in the process of developing our long range plan and we have been developing um, aspects of it for about a year and a half now. So we start the very public portion of that um, about 18 months out before we adopt it and we have done many things to try and get public input into that process and when we say public input some of it of course we are speaking of the general public but mostly we're speaking of our stakeholders because they actually have uh, uh, more familiarity with the specifics around that and of course from our elected officials um, so in that process we have done many things such as round tables that many of you have participated in uh, town halls that you might have participated in we did uh, a crowd gauge tool we did um, a statistically significant survey and all of that is to try and ascertain what people want and what they would be looking for in a transportation system that um, <clears throat> is the transportation system that would support the region and we look out 30 years so normally we look out 20 years but because 2050 was a nice round number and and because of the many long-term uh, kinds of uh, projects that we were looking at, it made more sense to, to do 2050. And so uh, with that, uh, we developed uh, four scenarios. Uh, this is the first time that we did scenario planning for the long range plan. Uh, normally what the NOACA staff would do is develop one scenario and then we would have that scenario and allow people to comment on it and we would hope that that one scenario would capture uh, what it is that, that people um, want in that system. Uh, this time we decided to do four scenarios, <clears throat> um, giving people more of an option to look at what it is that could be part of the system and what that impact would be. So we intentionally did four stark scenarios to be able uh, to ascertain that impact of each one of them. Um, and, and the scenarios are maintain, car, transit, and total. And with the car scenario, I'm sorry, with the maintain scenario, um, it very much <clears throat> aligns with the, uh, the trend scenario that is often called the trend scenario in some scenario analyses. Um, with that, uh, and I guess I should probably say, uh, those scenarios um, all have the same basis which the same basis is a, um, a level of a state of good repair or pavement conditions of I think 75 out of 100. Um, they all have uh, some very basic things to them that would have been sort of the scenario that would have been the only scenario had we done a scenario, just one. So they have got to start with that. Then with maintain, uh, we elevate all of the state of good repair from a PCR of 75 to a PCR of 80. And so that we're going to focus our funding on that, that component. Um, in two car, we add some additional kinds of um, improvements relative to auto access. Sure, no, no worries. I'm sure it's bothering 
Thank sorry, you. Sorry, sorry, no problem. Uh, just as a point of clarification, you refer to PCR. Oh, I'm sorry, payment, payment condition, condition ratings. Pay, right. Yes. Just, just those You're right. Some, some, yes, aware. yes. Um, and, and the idea is the payment condition ratings would be higher under maintain because we would uh, put more resources into elevating it to that higher level. Um, again, in the car scenario, uh, we're looking at making some improvements to the automobile environment, uh, such as interchanges and such. When you get to transit, uh, we had a visionary scenario that was included in the last long-range plan. And when we say visionary, a long-range plan must be what we call physically constrained. I'm sorry, fiscally constrained. <laughs> I feel physically constrained and because of COVID for uh, 18 months. But no, I meant to say uh, uh, fiscally constrained. So you cannot put projects into the long-range plan based on the federal regs unless you can um, have a source of funding to pay for them. And so public transit, <clears throat> particularly uh, both for Cuyahoga County and regionally was something that um, in the last plan, many of our partners wanted us to look at, uh, specifically Cuyahoga County Executive um, Armin Budish asked us to take a look at a more robust system uh, for public transit um, in Cuyahoga County, as well as many of our other members in the outlying counties um, asked us to look at public transit going into their business districts. And so um, as we did that, we did come up with a plan um, that is about, four, well, in 2017 was $14 billion for public transit. That isn't something, um, even, um, you know, e even those that are, um, I guess, even those that wanted us to really be strong in the public transit uh, still could not determine a way to really pay for that, that they were willing to document and, and to put out there. So we put it sort of as an illustrative project. So we're allowed to do that and say, this is something that we um, have looked at. It's something that our members may want, our region may want, um, but we don't have identified funding for it. So we cannot, uh, in, in good faith, keep it into the long range plan. So we did have that transit plan as an illustrative visionary. Uh, we did include that <clears throat> in scenario three with some adjustments and um, essentially that visionary plan and I, I apologize i normally have powerpoint so i'm uh, that's my crutch and so i've got lots of visuals but i don't have those visuals so i'm trying to describe them as best as i can um, but those visual um, uh, when you talk about uh, the transit plan that we have in the 2017 aim forward uh, long-range plan um, when you look at that and you say well what is in here um, we took the 1968 plan for NOACA, it's long range plan. So 1968, that was when the, organ, um, the agency was first formed and it had its long range plan. And there were two components of that long range plan. One was the roadway or highway system and the other was transit. And the roadway highway system was entirely built out. So the plan that was there in 1968 has been accomplished and more. There have actually been more uh, uh, roadways in terms of the highway network that was built out. On the transit side, um, hardly anything was done. So in 1968, the transit system that was there, um, there's only been an addition of two miles of, uh, of transit relative to the rail system. And on the bus side, it's contracted quite a bit. So uh, in reality, we have a much smaller system than we had in 1968. So in the 2017 plan, part of what we were looking at, and we were coming up on our 50th anniversary, so we did want to focus very closely on that 1968 plan and see what did we accomplish and what do we still have to do as a region. Um, in, in doing that, uh, we said we needed to focus a little bit more on the transit. That's essentially what's represented in uh, scenario three. And the rail system mirrors what the highway system was according to that 1968 plan. So you have a rail system that goes down 71, goes across 480, goes uh, uh, down 71 into Medina. So it actually connects to Medina, um, uh, 480 east to west. So collect connecting Lorraine to uh, Cuyahoga County. Um, it has 90 East connecting uh, Cuyahoga County to uh, Lake County and um, then 90 West going to Lorraine. So every county has um, additional rail service 
in, in terms of a rail system, except for Geauga County. Uh, they did not want public transit, um, and there really isn't the density there to warrant it, so we did not put any in Geauga County. Um, and, and, and so that, that's the plan. Uh, that's essentially what is represented in scenario three. And then scenario four was an attempt to try and take the best parts of one, two, and three that made sort of uh, reasonable sense and that looked like it might uh, because at this point, when we finalized the scenarios, it was probably December, January timeframe. So we've, at this point, gained about a, a year's worth of information from people and saying, what do people want and trying to come up with something. So that total scenario is essentially representative of many of the different components of the other scenarios, but then also really emphasizing uh, new technology, so uh, maximizing on the autonomous vehicles, uh, maximizing on, uh, and when we say vehicles, uh, shuttles mostly um, that are included in that scenario, um, maximizing um, the Hyperloop. So the Hyperloop is a project that we have looked at. Um, uh, we completed a feasibility study last year, and it go, it, the, the Hyperloop is a new form of, tech, of uh, transportation uh, based on technology, and it's a hybrid between an airplane and a train, essentially. Essentially. So airplane speeds at ground level, and it's Chicago to Cleveland to Pittsburgh, or Cleveland to Pittsburgh, Cleveland to Chicago. Uh, that is included in scenario four, and so we have a substantial amount of um, uh, research that was done, analysis that was done, to determine what the impacts of the Hyperloop would be, and we put that in scenario four. Um, so that's kind of, a, in a nutshell, the, the distinguishing points between the, the scenarios. And they are intentionally stark to, to help demonstrate what, what are the impacts. Um, some of the questions that you raised in your uh, letter that you sent us, which again, thank you very much for that feedback. Uh, we appreciate it when our stakeholders, and especially folks who are on the NOACA board and the councils and committees take uh, their role seriously and really take a look at what it is that they want and let us know that. That's why we have the meetings. Uh, that's why we have the, the outreach. We did the stakeholder meeting with um, the uh, economic development directors, the county engineers, and the uh, county planning directors at one time to be able to have that discussion and then get that feedback. Uh, we also then had one with the transit agencies and ODOT. We thought that was a nice combination, ODOT and transit agencies, so they can understand uh, what it is that we're looking for in those scenarios. And so we appreciate the feedback. Um, but I want to be clear that I think there might have been um, either some... Um, I mean, I mean, they're complicated scenarios, and you can only um, discuss so much in an hour and a half meeting. And so not all of it perhaps was uh, communicated as, um, as, as best as it could be. Um, and so to be clear, in terms of population and uh, job growth, uh, we do use the same um, estimates that come from the Ohio Department of Development um, as those baseline scenarios. So scenario one and scenario two, scenario three, four, they all start with those assumptions. So we do not create our own population assumptions. They are whatever the state has. And the state typically, um, over the trending of the last number of uh, decades, couple of decades, has essentially has seen Cuyahoga County restrict in population and uh, jobs, and then the exurban counties are can often are called the counter, the collar counties, um, grow both in population and in jobs. And you've seen that trend over the net last number of decades. You've seen it played out. That is what is included. So that's what we started with. And when you look at the maintained scenario, if you're looking to keep the, uh, the, the road network intact, but simply make it better from a maintenance perspective, it's going to add to that. So it does have impact that strengthens the um, Ohio Department of Development um, projections and so it, it does remain relatively constant in that trend growth uh, the same with car so car um, the the amenities that are added for the car scenario strengthen that so you will see uh, slight changes in the population and jobs as has been the trend for the last uh, few decades when you get to transit um, there have been changes made to the population and to the jobs uh, related to uh, just that transit component that's been added. So it starts with the same analysis as scenario one and two and then layers on top of it the transit component that says if we have a much more robust transit system, 
14 billion dollars worth of a robust uh, transit system what is the impact to jobs and what is the impact to population and based on uh, uh, industry uh, guidelines and and understandings there would be additional um, growth in population and jobs near transit hubs that would be the idea um, and, and so yes you do see growth there um, then you see even more growth in um, uh, scenario four because you are looking at the transit scenario that's been layered in there and then the hyperloop and the majority of the population and job growth that you see in scenario four is related to the hyperloop and so if we choose not to put the hyperloop in there you would see it go very down close to three if we choose not to put the, the transit uh, plan in there because we don't have it fiscally constrained, we don't have uh, the finances identified, then you end up much more with what you have in one and two, which is typically what you're accustomed to seeing. Um, so that's kind of uh, what the scenarios try to show in a nutshell. And we don't intend to select one scenario and move forward. The idea is to isolate the different impacts so we can see what happens. Um, but the idea would be what works for communities? What do we hear? What can we afford? All of those questions come into play. And then we would develop a scenario, which number four is what we tried to do with that. But we did add in um, Hyperloop. And, and so my my my. My thought on this is that Hyperloop, um, we still have to think about whether or not we would add that as a, an actual project. Um, it is private sector uh, funded, so it is anticipated that it would not be publicly funded. And the private sector, um, if, if they are um, at this point uh, willing to say that they will pay for it, we may put it in. We still haven't decided on that. Um, if, if things are still uncertain, because even the technology is not quite there, uh, we may put it as an illustrative example, just like we did with public transit last time. And so say, yes, we're interested in Hyperloop. We're serious about it, but we're going to put it here as illustrative, visionary. It will not be in the actual plan. Uh, maybe four years, eight years, because we update this every four years, four, eight years, perhaps when we have more information and there's more commitment, we can amend it to the plan and actually add it in there. Um, and and so, uh, uh, you know, looking at, at, at those things, we would pick um, in maintain um, the PCRs are 80 as opposed to 75, which is what we kind of have as our goal now. Uh, we more likely than now will say, in the best scenario, we'd love to have 80. Can we afford it? I don't know. Is that what our priorities? Most likely it will not be any lower than 75, which then gets you into scenario two at a 75 plus a few other things. We have about eight interchanges that we are looking at right now. Uh, some of them are, um, are justified based on the traffic analysis uh, right now. Um, I, I want to say half of them maybe are, and the other half not yet. So the other half may end up going into the uh, sort of the, the futuristic or that visionary part of it. I'm saying that they're not ready for addition into a long range plan now. Some of them will, will be able to go in there. Um, and then same with transit. Uh, more likely than not, we will not be able to afford that rail system. I don't have a, a commitment uh, from any of the counties where the rail system would be going in that they're willing to tax themselves at that level in order to afford that. Uh, so that visionary plan um, might not come to fruition, but maybe there's pieces of it that we can take out, like the automated shuttles that could take people from the end of rail, sta rail stations to uh, uh, different kinds of employment. For example, uh, one of the things that we have thought of relative to autonomous shuttles, um, looking at uh, job centers, and that's another thing I know that was important uh, in your discussion. Um, in the scenarios that we focused on, when we focus on uh, job hubs or job centers, uh, we have many of them in the region, but they're divided up into two tiers. So we have major job hubs and minor job hubs. Some people call them uh, regional job hubs and sub-regional job hubs. Essentially, um, those job hubs are determined by the density of jobs in a certain location, as well as um, the, so it's the density of jobs as well as the uh, percentage of workers that come from different parts of the region. So uh, when you look at how that's defined, uh, the density and the number of workers coming from the five county region into a job hub makes it major or minor. Um, it is, uh, at this point, uh, the six major job hubs happen to be in Cuyahoga County. 
um, and I know again this is something that you all talked about at your last meeting I can assure you we did not create job hubs to put them in Cuyahoga County uh, they were already there and and they also over the last five decades have moved it was predominantly downtown um, at one point downtown Cleveland that has dispersed in many areas uh, throughout Cuyahoga County and even into uh, uh, the the collar counties uh, so when we look at that, those are the major job hubs. In scenario three, where we had an increase in population and an increase in jobs, um, that was attributed to rail. And so therefore, if it's attributed to rail and there's a significant amount of uh, rail that are that is in Cuyahoga County, um, as had been requested by Cuyahoga for us to study, um, there are some, again, in the other uh, counties, but the majority of it being in Cuyahoga, it becomes natural that the jobs then would gravitate towards that and the population would gravitate toward that in that scenario. But I assure you, it's also there in all of the scenarios, um, including three and four, are the tier two or the uh, minor job hubs that in, are included in each of the counties. So in, in uh, Medina County, you have three job hubs. And we have worked on uh, classifying these over the last couple of years. We've worked with uh, uh, Bethany Dentler's um, office uh, to, to help us identify those densities and, and also looking at where the future growth might be and trying to say that we want to be be supportive of what the counties are doing. So if the counties have these uh, job hubs in their county and they're trying to grow those, then we want to be supportive of that. We don't want to propose something totally new or we're going to try and say that, you know, let, let's all work together to make sure what those investments should look like. So there is, um, there are three in, in Medina County. And when we talk about the rail system, for example, in scenario three, um, the rail does go down to connect to one of those job hubs in, in uh, Medina County. And so anyway, that, that's kind of what we were doing and, and understand that at this point it is still exploratory. So we're trying to put information out, get reactions to that, engage people, um, have them show us what they want and we, we try to map that out and take a look at it. Um, but ultimately our objective is to um, develop a regional transportation plan that supports the entire region and not every uh, transportation solution is going to work for every part of the region. So some counties uh, may have no public transit um, other than the rural component like Geauga County. Others may have a very robust transit system like Cuyahoga County. Um, in Lorraine County, they don't have currently a robust transit system, but they would like one. They've tried to put a couple of levies um, out there. They have not passed yet, but they still want one. So that also might be something we put into a illustrative or regional and say, when you have that levy passed, then we will move it and adopt it into the long range plan. Um, uh, so again, we're trying to make things um, so that all parts of the region can thrive, all parts of the region have a planned system, and that we're being responsive to the folks. Now, we also know that there are some decisions that have to be made at some point uh, that speak to what is best for the region, and that's something that our board has to decide what that looks like. So that isn't something staff decides. We provide the information and we say we think this is uh, what people are suggesting they want. This is what we think it would cost. This is how it would impact things. And what, um, you know, what makes something regional? What is a regionally significant project? And what is something that we think all of the counties can support? Um, I think the major project that we have, the major regional asset that we probably have that everybody can agree on, or at least close to everybody can agree on it, is the airport. Cleveland Hopkins International Airport is a transportation asset that is regional, truly regional. Um, every county can benefit from that, um, both from the perspective of uh, travel, uh, personal travel, as well as freight. Um, so there is some, some value to that. And if we were to invest dollars, which we are currently looking at as part of the city of Cleveland's master plan, um, uh, we are looking at, uh, they are looking at, and with us and with ODOT, um, some uh, reconfiguration of I-71. And so if there's a reconfiguration of I-71 uh, to give you direct access from the south into uh, the, the airport as well as having to better um, uh, utilize 237 and 480 for their own travel and not sort of uh, encumber that for the airport. That's probably something that we will say everybody benefits from and it's a regional um, uh, uh, project. 
Another example of a regional project is Irish Town Bend. So Irish Town Bend is um, a project that we uh, are working on with the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Port Authority. We were able to get funding from the federal government, close to $10 million, to support that project, which is about a $40 million project total. And that project is uh, restoring the Cuyahoga River's uh, bulkheads essentially to keep it from collapsing because if it collapses and the ships can't get through um, you saw what just happened in the Suez Canal uh, something like that could possibly happen in the Cuyahoga and if that happens we have 3.5 billion dollars worth of economic activity that comes to a grinding halt and that economic activity is not constrained to Cuyahoga County it's it, it's the entire region and in fact uh, when Adam Frederick one of your former county commissioners was uh, NOACA president um, he went to Washington with me to advocate for that additional funding from the feds for that um, and, and recognized that um, he was, a, a, I believe, a plant manager for a, a, uh, a, an industrial company out in Lorain County. Um, he acknowledged that he's got uh, shipments coming in and shipments going out, so they need iron ore to come in to make steel for the uh, goods and also recognized that a lot of the product that comes out of uh, Medina County's uh, light manufacturing industry goes out and comes in that way too. So again, recognizing that that's a regional asset. So we try to identify those regional assets, say this is what we need to as priority to strengthen the region's economy and then also identify what it is that each of the uh, counties need and then supporting um, supporting them in those efforts so uh, I think hopefully that will um, uh, now turn that over to you for questions yes thank you Grace um, so the the um, presentation that that was distributed and we all looked at was called the long-range plan scenario evaluation mm -hmm. So that is a step in the process. Correct. Um, and so at this point in time, NOAC is still collecting feedback from the community. That is correct. Right. We do not have a proposed plan yet. The plan does not exist. We are currently still evaluating all of the information. Um, we have integrated this time a little bit more um, explicitly things like land use, housing, economic development, um, and... Um, environment and so those portions of it we're kind of working on uh, as well so yes you will not see a um, a draft plan uh, for the board's review until I believe the May executive committee meeting so prior to that meeting we would send out a draft plan okay questions yeah actually uh, have a ton, but that, uh, let me get down to I think we're going to need more time. Obviously, I've got, okay. I've got a ton of questions. Of course, I'm newest to, uh, to this process. I wasn't around last year, other than uh, observing from uh, you know, 120 miles south uh, and other, other things in, on my mind, but being aware that there's some significant uh, changes going on. We are in the middle of a historic pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no doubt. Uh, and uh, our international economy, our national economic structure uh, has fundamentally altered uh, our social interactions, our business practices, uh, e even, even workforce development uh, is totally different now mm -hmm. and projected um, than what we had pre-COVID. The problem I have with this is, you know, you're talking about a lot of the journey to work uh, portion of it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, all the studies are showing since COVID, those numbers have dropped significantly. We know commuter patterns have changed. Uh, the options people have to work at home versus work in the office, that uh, communication, Zoom, that we have all depended mm -hmm. upon, has changed the demands, not only of transportation, but significantly transit. And many of those that are actually returning to work are not preferring transit for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, all the data and all the planning we're doing is premised on, I'll just say maybe mid-COVID for portions of it. I know you did some surveys based upon our that one workshop, but we also have a lot of pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. Why we're such a hurry to go ahead and approve this now before, number one, we have a real uh, appreciation of what these fundamental changes look like and will look like in the future. All the futurists are looking at it and say, this remote work is here to stay. Uh, the definition of an employee is going to continue to evolve, whether you work at home or whether you work in the city. And of course, we know there's tax consequences to that, and the legislature is going to continue to work with that. Like, what are you going to do if really 
you kind of report to an office, but you never work there, so should you pay us an income tax? Uh, those issues are going to be wrangled mm -hmm. out. That has a significant impact on your job yes. hubs. Let's face it, it will. Yep. So, uh, so we're, we're, and we've got a number of scenarios. I mean, I would challenge some of the what you provided. Uh, the, the one most egregious was you, it doesn't go down 71, it goes down 42. <laughs> so if you look at the map I've got it up in front of me, it actually parallels 71. Once you get, uh, once you get basically uh, south of Brook Park and over to the Turnpike, it deviates from the Turnpike all the way down 42. Uh, what are you uh, this is the rail. And so, and I, and I was on that transit call when they said, you know, drop the rail. Uh, this is this is problematic because of, I mean the higher investment, and that was RTA telling you that. Mm -hmm. So this input, it's like okay, uh, and I understand that you know maybe it might look nice to look say, hey, we're going to involve you, we're going to take a rail. It's not going to happen. It's just I'm a rail historian. I can tell you, it's not. We're not going to relive the uh, the age of a hundred years ago when it comes to transit transit transportation, particularly rail. But all these changes, what does the time frame need to be that we would need to uh, do this? And the other component, other than the fundamental changes going on, is the census data is not even out. It's mm -hmm. been backed up six months. That's the data we really ought to be looking at. Yep. Because that was a lot of that was done over the last year, year and a half during COVID, mm -hmm. and if we don't take that into consideration, I, I, I can't even uh, I can't even tell you how much of a fallacy that would be in any kind of plan we adopt. Because we know the plan will drive investment, correct? And the investment decisions not only in the public sector but the private sector as well. And my fear is premised on old data. Uh, we'll just say that data that's no longer valid and create uh, and based on the number of assumptions we're just we're just headed for a fool's paradise mm -hmm. and um, and I, but like I said I've got a lot of other individual questions I've looked at uh, uh, the uh, uh, what was it uh, oh Morpsy as well as code is planned down in Columbus I've kind of uh, been more, uh, you know, how they're involved, their process. They do a lot of land use components of that, as you know, being a planning commission for that and the interactions and so forth. So they're a bit more detailed. But what I've found that they've been able to do is in their plan, they have included the visions of all these communities in their plan. When they've started building their uh, transport, long range transportation, they actually included the land use plans, they included all this information as part of that database and they looked at the, uh, along these corridors. My question, when we can go into detail, is did we include the dreams and the aspirations of, of the five counties? Maybe Cuyahoga? Okay. But I'm not sure, and I don't see that. I, what we've done, I think, in a plan, the perception I have is we've not assimilated these aspirations for long range transportation in those counties. We've actually eliminated them. And I would seek, and I, and I know it would probably take a lot more time than we have certainly today or in the future, but I would suggest that maybe you're going to have to rethink this and go back out to the various stakeholders in the counties and see if, you know, mm -hmm. see what we can do, especially as the data is starting to be updated. Yeah, um, so if, if I may address that, um, first of all, uh, you're absolutely right that uh, the census data is not here and it would be a much more accurate uh, plan if we had that census data available. Uh, also acknowledging that we began this plan, uh, the development of the plan prior to the pandemic, and we have seen uh, transportation uh, use, both public transit as well as automobile decline. Uh, VMTs are down 33%. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, although Be today vehicle miles traveled, <laughs> vehicle miles traveled. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, although my drive down here today from uh, Shaker Heights shows me that I think people are back out on the road. Um, um, also, with public transit, yes, there was substantial decline in public transit. Um, uh, activity specifically because the CDC Center for Disease Control uh, of the US government told people not to use public transit during the pandemic it was it was not advised so yes you absolutely see those those components um, the issue here is we have no choice but to develop this plan and adopt it by June of this year. So that is a federal requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have latitude to do anything different. However, there are two aspects of this that we can modify. One is we do allow changes to the long range plan every single quarter. 
Um, so we can certainly look to see how we can amend it based on those. We also have a major update every four years. So there's the opportunity for us to start preparing for that next major update. Uh, so it's not as if this is a creation of a brand new plan out of nowhere. Um, this is the same plan from 1968. It just continually gets updated and it gets updated in a way that becomes more relevant. What have we accomplished? What we haven't? What's changed? And, and so we move forward. So there is um, some necessity to update that plan uh, with both of those issues when we see how things have changed uh, with COVID. And we also see, for example, uh, a company like Sherwin-Williams, who has said, despite the fact that COVID has had remote work, uh, we will continue to press forward with both our headquarters in Cleveland and our research facility in Brexville because we believe that working in person is what we want as our corporate culture. Mm -hmm. So it's going to depend on company to company. And, and so we'll, that, that's going to remain to be seen. And we'll, we'll need to watch that and then certainly add that into uh, the development of any kind of amendments to the long range plan. Um, when it comes to the, the RTA, I mean, I will say that, and the visions are the dreams of all of the counties, we thought that we did include that. I mean, I recognize that um, you're, you're new to this plan, and that is what we try to do. And it's not that we do it in every single uh, uh, turn, because a lot of it is already inherent in there. For example, uh, the hopes and dreams of Medina County relative to its um, job hubs we have worked with Medina County and we hope we have captured that. If we have not, then we need to amend that and make sure that we do capture that. Uh, when it comes to um, things like uh, population or growth, we've worked with Medina County um, relative to the, uh, the, the FPA boundaries, recognizing that there's gonna be development and growth in Medina County and where it will be located. And we've used that information in the development of the plan. Um, I, I think some of the things that you have to realize is um, in scenario planning, a lot of it is high level. We're not getting into specific projects to that. I mean, there are projects in there, but not to the level of detail. Um, you know, when it when we talk about the rail going down I-71 or versus 42, I'd have to look because that just might be a line on the map that looks closer to 42. But the idea, the idea, again, this is um, illustrative more so mm -hmm. than it is. Th these are not alternatives analyses. They are not even uh, uh, very much concept basis is very, very, very early planning. And so the idea is to take what was in that 1968 plan, which was following I-71 down, and to, to make that part of a plan. Um, and, and when it comes to, again, the, the hopes and dreams of each of the counties, uh, Geauga County told us they didn't want transit. We didn't include that. Uh, Cuyahoga County said, let's take a look at a more robust system to meet that 1968 requirement. But then if there isn't funding for it, it isn't going to happen. I mean, it's just going to go into illustrative. And what we're trying to do with these scenarios is just be responsive to all kinds of questions. In prior years, when we only had one scenario and we didn't include things like public transit, we were, you know, we were criticized by all the public transit people and those that wanted in the other counties saying, why are you always looking at the automobile? Why aren't you looking at public transit? So the idea here is we look at all of it and then we see what makes sense, what's realistic, what's affordable. And again, none of this is um, something that can't be um, amended or altered as more information comes in and as more, uh, more of the people who are looking for change um, can demonstrate that that change is in fact supported. So Grace, um, in May, um, the, the actual plan itself will be presented correct in an update so we can circulate that you have our feedback yes now, um, from our communities and, and stakeholders here in Medina County uh, will that influence the plan oh absolutely uh, absolutely that that is the entire reason to have created the scenarios and to get the feedback is because ultimately um, I don't think any of those scenarios in it's in, in each of their entireties will be a scenario that works for based on what we're hearing. We thought maybe total would be it, but it may not be it. So we may end up coming up with a scenario that, again, the scenarios are for planning purposes. Once we actually develop the plan, it will be the plan. And the component that will the pl be the plan, um, when it comes to those different aspects of information that's included, most likely will include different aspects of each of those four in the actual plan. So that would be the idea. Grace, aren't we 
we're obligated to update the the, the, the current plan as, to, as the AIM 2040, correct? Correct. Was, which was adopted when Adam Frederick actually was president. Which is why it's called it, him being a hunter, which is why we uh, <laughs> called it AIM 2040. <laughs> Little anecdotal stuff. Okay, so uh, so we, we just were obligated to update it, but we're not obligated as to what is included in that update is really up to us, correct? It's up to the board to determine whether we want to do this uh, scenario fishing and just kind of go like this, or do we just want to take a look at uh, that 10-year transition based upon what we know or what we kind of knew in the last couple of years and, and include that, knowing that we still have another next four or five years that we can update, but there's some of these other things that would need much more time to define. Um, I mean, uh, the passenger rail study that was done in, in 2007, I didn't see reference to this at all. Um, and I know there was a lot of money spent, and that was, of course, before your term. I'm sorry, which, which study is the this? The passenger rail study. From where to where? Uh, that w it actually looked at the viability of routes even into Medina, used the current, uh, current rail, rail lines. Uh, the, the most promising lines were actually out to Lorraine. But at that time, uh, Congressman uh, Kucinich uh, blocked mm -hmm. uh, um, a passenger rail service to go out there, and that was thought to be the most viable. So that was, of course, uh, during the... Um, uh, well, we, Strickland was the, the governor at that point in time, okay. and there was, they were looking at the CCC, but they also were looking at passenger rail. NOACA spent a lot of money and time. Everybody did. We had sessions out here in Medina County. So I don't even see reference to that when you looked at rail. And so, that, like I said, there's a lot of questions I have in the development of this that causes me to say, okay, why are we confusing with the scenarios when we just ought to do a simple update Given the data we have, knowing that there's some additional data coming very quickly, that we then really ought to be concentrated on, number one, the next update. Number two, we have a three to four trillion dollar transportation bill coming in from Congress, and I think we're going to have unprecedented a historical investment available in transportation. And if we're not ready to use that money wisely, I don't want to see it going down a whole boondoggle uh, that some might suggest a hyperloop might be. So, I mean, right. I know that we're, we're kind of in preparation and it's going to be all, all private sector, but like I said, there's no proven technology quite yet. Mm -hmm. We might as well put transporters from starships in outer space while we're at it. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> I completely agree with Steve. It's disappointing that we have to kind of solidify this plan by June because there is so many things in the very near future coming down, more information that we will get. And there are so many things that for the foreseeable future will have changed forever. I, I, I know you talked about Sherwin-Williams, but there's many, many companies who mm -hmm. have not decided um, the configuration of how their workplace will be. And they're not going, they're not going to decide in 2021. Um, and, and how, it, with the Hyperloop scenarios, how realistic is the private funding for the Hyperloop scenarios? Or are we just talking pipe dream kind of scenarios? It's very realistic, but again, it, what we're saying is we will not include it unless it is privately funded. So we have no interest in including it in the plan unless it's privately funded. But right now, um, as we had been working uh, with the prior administration, I'm not really sure where this current administration stands on the Hyperloop, but we had been working for the last three years with the prior administration who was very, very much supportive and pushing Hyperloop as a public-private partnership. And so we were working with that assumption that uh, USDOT, in fact, they formed a special uh, committee to review and to advance all of of the, um, uh, the technology and the deployment of Hyperloop, uh, looking at it as the new generation of high-speed rail. And so again, if the, if the new Biden administration changes their perspective on that and dismantles all of the Hyperloop, uh, uh, the net council, and dismantles any of support for it financially and otherwise, then that would be the direction we would take. So we are not driving this. It's the US DOT, uh, Washington, as well as the private developers that are driving that. So Grace, again, um, we're, we're going to get a draft plan coming up here in the next um, almost a month, six weeks or so. Um, and we'll have the opportunity to review that and I guess then it'll go to the full NOACA board uh, for approval. Correct. And, and remembering that this is an update and 
you know, although we can, you know, uh, uh, Commissioner Heimerly, the, the one point that I will make, though, is although the NOACA board gets to decide how they want to update it, the federal government does have a substantial amount of uh, guidelines and regulatory uh, things that we have to meet in order to determine a long-range plan. One of them is a very in-depth exploration of public transit. We are obligated to do that because NOACA's funding, a third of NOACA's funding for planning comes from the Federal Transit Administration. And when we get our quadrennial review, it's not just Federal Highway, it's both Federal Highway and Federal Transit. And both of them also want scenario planning and want us to sort of uh, uh, talk to the public about their different things that they would want. And then we kind of get into the realism, but so we are following the process. It's unfortunate that, that um, COVID happened in the middle of it because that does change a lot of things. But on the other hand, it is one of the reasons that these plans do get updated and we have the ability then to include better information. So we will be coming back. And if the board, if the NOACA board wants, I mean, one of the things that I foresee, and I can't say it's, an, it's completely set yet because I am still gathering input from folks like yourselves and the other counties. Uh, more likely than not, it will not be a substantial update in the plan uh, for the projects, for the, the, but rather they'll be illustrative. Um, and it will probably, we will probably recommend rather than a four year update the next time, which is what the requirement is, maybe in one year or two years, once we have the census and once we have um, additional information on the COVID, we can do an update to the plan without scenarios, but just saying this is what we've adopted and, and let's update it for the information we now have to better represent uh, what that might mean. And, and you mentioned that we can update it every quarter or every six months. We, we currently have necessary. updates to the plan every quarter. Yeah. And they're usually projects. So, for example, if, in fact, the, the private sector came to us tomorrow and said, uh, we now have the technology for Hyperloop and the federal government supports the regulatory, because that's what the feds are in for. They're not in for the financials. It's the regulatory. They're supporting the regulatory, and we've got the technology, and we're going to fund it. Um, NOACA, we need you to update your long-range plan. Yes. In, in one quarter, uh, and normally it takes two quarters. We do it every quarter, but by the time the projects get through, it's a little bit longer. So between three to six months, we could add that in so they could move forward to it if that was uh, reasonable. And same with all of the other projects like the airport. Um, any, any change to I-71 isn't in there because it still has to be studied. And then when it's studied, and if it's determined to be a viable project, they would come to NOACA, um, well, we would be along for that entire study, but uh, then it would need to be approved by NOACA once the alternatives were presented and the NOACA board would select an alternative. But if this $3 trillion infrastructure bill is approved, we may have to update the plan much quicker. And with more than just projects, update the plan. Um, you know, there's a little bit of, yes, maybe, uh, we don't really know a lot of what comes out of the, the, the trillion, the three trillion dollar uh, plan. Right now we are being asked, just like I'm sure many of you are, uh, what are your earmarks that you would like out of that plan? And so uh, those will all be included in there and those are uh, being done at a very localized level. Um, so I think that will be a substantial portion of it. Uh, what we're being asked to give now, uh, um, isn't quite it doesn't quite make sense so we're not sure how this will be deployed for example what we're being asked is to give them uh, projects that are currently included in our tip for earmarks but if it's in the tip it already has funding you cannot be in the federal tip without funding so if you're asking me to give you projects that are in my tip, I already have funding for them. Those are not the ones I need funding for. I need funding for projects that are in the plan that are not yet funded. And that's another reason why, despite the fact that we may want to be cautious um, in the development of a plan, we also want to be um, aggressive enough to have projects that we could actually f uh, put into uh, fruition once those funds come. Um, again, looking at more regional kinds of projects or even the more localized ones that, um, that, that are agreeable to everyone um, as we're looking at how to, how to, how to advance it. So that tri the $3 trillion plan is going to include the five-year regular um, transportation bill. And that current transportation bill um, that exists is only 
about two thirds funded. Um, so it's only been funded by the Highway Trust Fund for two thirds. The other third of it's been in the general fund. Um, so when you talk about three trillion and, and you look at what the revenues are, what the expenditures are, and then you look at all the earmarks that, are, that will be coming off the top, um, I, I'm not sure that there's as much, um, much as, as much there that you know it'll remain to be seen uh, it's where the discretionary fu funds that we can right. do other projects with, right. right okay any other questions we do need to get moving on here but well just a comment um, and maybe this is more from a messaging standpoint than we've talked about this mm -hmm. you know when you look at scenarios three and four particularly it, it feels so centric on Cuyahoga County and I know you and I have talked and uh, you know, there is more underlying growth that's happening in the other regions, but the presentations aren't showing that. And so it, it creates a reaction like, you know, the other counties are not being impacted or taken into consideration, in particularly in scenarios three and four. Yeah. So I think, you know, that data needs to be presented maybe in a different way so we could get a more complete understanding because, you know, the way it looks right now, it, you know, it feels like, you know, everything is being directed towards those job hubs in Cuyahoga County. And as I shared with you uh, earlier, you know, from an economic developer standpoint, our businesses have a hard enough time finding people. Mm -hmm. I don't need more resources right. being directed to driving those people out of Madonna County right. into another county when we have plenty of work here for them to do. Yeah, and, and again, the scenario three um, is based on the Ohio Development, Ohio Department, Department of Development's numbers for population and job growth, just like scenarios one and two. They have an incremental increase in population and job growth as a result of the transit scenario that is predominantly reflective of the 1968 plan. So it does have growth in that. And yes, the majority of that incremental growth is in Cuyahoga County because that's the where the transit system is. When we, if we do not move forward with that system, Cuyahoga County and those job growth, it will not exist. I mean, those are, and same with the Hyperloop. Once we take the Hyperloop out of scenario four, that job growth and that population growth will disappear. I mean, there's a 10% um, uh, increase in population and job growth as a result of both the Hyperloop and the transit between the two scenarios. I think it's 3% and maybe 7%, which gets you to 10 in that last scenario. If we take those out, which is likely because we don't have enough information or funding commitments to make it happen, we will go back to the Ohio Department Development's numbers, which are exactly as you say which is our in scenario one and two. They're also the baseline for three and four. The incremental are related to those areas of growth. Another way to look at this too, um, you know, when we look at the, the, the four scenarios, um, if I were only to have had car scenarios, scenario one and two, um, and not three or four, I would have been criticized by Cuyahoga County, by Lorain County, uh, by all of the, the, the transit advocates um, th that would say, you haven't even considered transit. Not to mention the fact that the FTA would probably not certify me the next time around when they do their quiet quadrennial review because they're gonna say, you didn't look at public transit and so we're not gonna certify you as the MPO any, uh, anymore because you're not doing your job. So. The scenarios are just to make sure we're looking at everything and, and understanding if we don't put a, a public transit plan out there that is representative of the 1968 plan, why? What's the reason? Well, the reason would be funding or the reason would be this or the reason would be that. It doesn't have enough support. Um, you know, and, and, and so that, that's just kind of what we're trying to do. But we appreciate and we've always appreciated the opportunity to work closely with uh, uh, Bethany and her team uh, to try and understand what you're what you're working on relative to workforce development. We've come down here and made presentations um, at her uh, directive to the Chamber of Commerce in Medina. Um, you know, we're working with all of the different uh, uh, communities. Um, you know, another I see uh, uh, Paul here from uh, Brunswick. You know, you're talking about uh, the the interchange uh, scenarios. Well, scenario two has interchanges in it, uh, but I was just told very definitively definitively by the Brunswick City Council that they do not want that interchange. And so if they do not They're want right. that interchange, um, 
It was very the, definitive. Very this definitive. City, it was this city council. There are some new members that are <laughs> some members <laughs> leaving. So I guess we wait and yeah. see. Okay. So, but but the point is, we're not going to put in a an interchange, despite the fact that a lot of people want that interchange. I've got a lot of folks um, at the state level calling about that interchange. But if the local doesn't want it, we're not going to force that interchange into that plan. And certainly, if three years from now or four years from now there is a total turnover and there's a new consensus on building it, we'll amend the plan and we'll put it in. Right. Just uh, one thing, just going back to the, uh, some of the topics we talked about with uh, Bethann, growth and both the job sector and population and look at being obligated to look at transit. And I can understand and appreciate that, but I think we need to base it on sound information and I, I think just building transit facilities is not going to get people to, to move there. There's other social and economic factors that need to be taken into account. So just saying, well, we have new transit facilities that's going to draw all these people. I, I think there's large, uh, there needs to be large considerations for the other factors of why for the past 40 years people have been moving out of their ur urban areas. Mm -hmm. and. And I think you can you can show that in the transit study and and fulfill your obligation without painting a, a rosier picture than maybe what actually exists. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I, I mean but, I, but I think we're glossing over that. Well, it, it, you know, when when you get into planning, there's a lot of different opinions and there's a lot of different studies. And, you know, for every study that, that you, you can find, one that says transit does not attract passengers, I'll find you three more that says if you build it, they will come. So there's, there's you know, and, and again, we're going using all of the industry tools to help get us there. But the point I, I wanted to part with the most, sort of to your point, is scenario one and scenario two are the scenarios that... Um, support Medina County in its growth as it has been trending over the last 50 years. So that it's not excluded. None of these scenarios, um, it, it, so all of that in scenario, even in scenario three, which is transit, that's still there. It's not that it's not there, it's that transit is on top of it. And so from our perspective, we think that we've covered everything and it's just a matter of what becomes fiscally um, able and regionally acceptable um, and so really you're looking at all of those things and, and the other thing I will mention about the uh, uh, the three trillion dollar uh, plan that is coming out with from uh, Washington I guarantee you it will be highly highly um, funding public transit there will be a huge piece of it to public transit so if in fact we don't want public transit and we don't put it in our plan that's okay but if we do want it and there's an opportunity to fund it that might also make sense so just trying to make sure that we're thinking about everything and and how wide open it it, it can be i would be the last one to suggest that we shouldn't be in fact fund transit i was on the General Assembly, when we added, and amongst the caucus, to push for additional funding, as we did last General Assembly, and also the gas tax, uh, and that helped everybody uh, on that. And so I absolutely agree. Uh, in 2017, when you had the AIM 2040, it did have transit in there. It didn't have the various scenarios, but it still got, uh, did it not get the federal accreditation? Uh, uh, certification for that but it's that same scenario that's in scenario three we just broke it out so the one that was in the aim 40 mm -hmm. 2040 is is scenario three it's the same one we've just called it now scenario you, you're three. talking about the rail scenario yes in the 20 okay i have to take a look at that i mean i think no. ali ali who's our uh modeler has said there's been some uh changes and some adjustments to mm -hmm. uh the aim 40 one but it is essentially you know, and I don't want to give a percentage, but it's essentially the same thing, which again builds on the 1968 plan. Mm -hmm. I guess it's, it's, it does beg, I guess, beg the issue is why Columbus is growing by hundreds of thousands of people over the next decade or two, and we're still, if you will, atrophying and not. Um, and there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of benefits here. It's not like they don't get snow, <laughs> and they don't get winter. <laughs> they do, maybe a little bit milder, but they do. Um, and uh, their ability to, to be able to also be certified, develop a plan, 
uh, doesn't they don't have rail, so they don't have that issue of extension of those kind of fixed assets. But they're able to very very adeptly with their transit system meet the needs of a, of a huge region. I'm very much impressed by you know their future. They've got their plan, which is just awesome. I um, mean, what they've forecasted. But they also don't have this whole idea of job hubs. They have corridors that they look to emphasize. And so that's the for me the real question comes down to is. We had an opportunity corridor that was funded and continues to receive funding and so forth. Why that, uh, if you will, concept is obviously more fully utilized for the scenarios rather than this kind of job hub and then using transit mm -hmm. to funnel everybody into a job location. Yeah, and again, each scenario is different and reflects a different um, yeah. aspect okay. of that. So I think that what you're talking about is reflected in one and two. Uh, but with the corridors, we would like nothing more as planners uh, to plan on, along corridors. Unfortunately, we didn't create the job hubs. They created themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, the free market is what we um, acknowledge in, in this country, that we allow the free economy to, to sort of drive those things. And so those six job hubs which are not on corridors were created and so now we're we would be either we'd have to move them to corridors that exist which i don't think is practical um or or you know really supportive of our values um, and so how do you service them where they are now is, is kind of what we're trying to do and um you know, I, I appreciate all the comments, and, and I think this is great, and we'll continue to take them under consideration for the, the finishing of this plan, but then always reminding you that it is, a, it is a living, breathing document. So we can certainly sit down with you, Commissioner Hamley, because I know you have both a, a tremendous history of uh, NOACA and a history of uh, rail, as you said, and you've got the experience at the state level. We would love to be able to sit down with you now that you are back in this position at the local level to talk about how we can improve the development of that long-range plan and if it means an update in a year from now or two years from now as opposed to the full four years I think that would be good I think that's that's fine I think we just we're, we are stuck with both COVID in the middle of this and then we were trying to better serve our um, uh, our constituency by describing different types of um, uh, opportunities uh, that exist um, and I think maybe I want to clarify too like in some scenario planning like the one that we did for uh, Vibrant Neo they came up with four scenarios and essentially picked one that isn't what we're trying to do the scenarios are intended to showcase what could happen or what would happen if you uh, focused on these kinds of things or if you layered something else in okay so Sorry, yeah. when uh, when I invited Grace here, uh, we, we talked about a 20-minute uh, time frame. We did. We an hour. <laughs> um, but Shannon, did you have one last comment? I'll digress. Okay. So, Grace, thank you very much sure. for coming. And, uh, and I very much appreciate it. This is a, a regional plan encompassing five counties, and um, I think from Madonna County standpoint, we just want to make sure that uh, that NOACA appreciates where we're coming from and can can give consideration yes. to our concerns. We absolutely are appreciative of it. We're grateful that you've taken the time to read through those, to understand them, and to give us those comments that will help us develop that plan that we present in May. So we are very, and, and you know, we here, as I heard Paul's counsel uh, a week or 10 days ago, um, we want to make sure that our plans reflect what you want. There's, right. there's, there is no, there is no attempt to try and put anything else that anybody else wants in there, except for what the community themselves want. All right. Thank okay, you, Grace. Sure, thank, thank you very you. much for coming down today. Nice to My pleasure. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, good to see you again. Thank you. Welcome back. And you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting if you'd like. Um, or not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pass thank on that one, much. but thank you thank very you much. Thank you for coming, Grace. We very much Bye -bye. appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, Rhonda, you're coming in. Uh, Steve, could I have a motion to approve yeah, the move minutes? Yeah, move to approve the minutes of March 23rd. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Hamley? Yes. Clinic? Yes. Hudson? Yes. And we'll move right into resolutions. Um, Andy Conrad, your county engineer, you're up. Is it still morning? It good morning, good morning. afternoon. Um, I have three resolutions for you this morning. The first is resolution accepting and awarding the 2021 replacement of bridge number 15 on the Eastern Road in Wadsworth Township. Second resolution is funding the or uh, finding the public convenience and welfare requires the resurfacing of Wilbur Road from State Route 94 
to a location approximately 2,500 feet west in Granger Township. And the third resolution is determining the necessity to close Black River School Road between Camp Road and Spencer Road. Move to approve the three resolutions. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Hamley? Yes. Sweater? Yes. Hudson? Yes. And the weekly permit list is there for you. Thank you, Andy. Good. Thanks. Appreciate you. it. Good to see you in person. Yeah. Uh, Thanks next up, we have Amy Lyon Galvin, our Assistant County Administrator. Good morning, Amy. Good morning. I have eight resolutions for your consideration this morning. The first resolution is amending the appropriation measure. The second resolution is amending the 2021 appropriations resolution by transferring appropriations. The third resolution is expenditure adjustments for various funds. The fourth resolution is sales tax distribution to the various districts located in Medina County. The fifth resolution is awarding the bid for the Medina County monopole steel tower and antenna. This is to enhance Harris radio coverage into Hinkley Township and surrounding areas for the Medina County Sheriff. And that is being awarded to Spielman Electric Incorporated for a contract price of $117,867. The sixth resolution is approving the Medina County ODOT Cooperative Agreement for the State Route 18 project. The seventh resolution is allowing expenses of county officials. This is for six participants from the Juvenile Detention Center and some local training. And the eighth resolution is uh, the claims for the week against the county in the amount of $705,509.43. Move to approve the eight resolutions. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'm glad our sales taxes stayed stable because it's nice to see those checks and yes first time i can remember that's actually been over four million dollars for the schools distributing to the schools yeah for schools yeah. on a quarterly basis yes. that's right really yeah mm -hmm. i don't like yes. it that's now we get an update from the tax department that gets sent out to that does that get sent out to them too to let them know how that's tracking Is that that's a great question do? i don't know the answer yeah. to that. i know we get it i'm sure when they uh, see uh, their checks the CCO, yeah. so, so can we just forward that just as a courtesy, just the school board uh, to um, the, the, yeah, the ESC or the treasurers? That mm -hmm. way they know. Mm -hmm. I, obviously, it's you know I'm not sure it impacts their spending uh, considering what their total budgets are, but still it's good to know that uh, they can see some of that money coming in. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. In terms of the cash. All right. Great. Thanks. Roll call, please. Hamley. Yes. Sweated. Yes. Hudson. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, next up, we have Holly Murin, our Human Resources Director. Good morning, Holly. Good morning. I have two resolutions for you today. On our personal changes resolution, we have one new hire uh, in transit, four promotions in sanitary, six rate increases, one in maintenance, three in sanitary, and two at job and family services. We have a return from leave at building department, a termination in building department, and a retirement in sanitary. Second resolution is approving the three-year collective bargaining agreement between Medina County Board of Developmental Disabilities in the Medina County Achievement Center Employees Association, OEA, NEA. Uh, move to approve both resolutions. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any questions? Roll call, please. Family? Yes. Sweater? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, next up, we have Scott Miller, our county administrator. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. I have five resolutions for you today. The first resolution is authorizing the sanitary engineer to commence advertising for construction bids. This is to install additional pumps at the North Pump Station in Sharon Township. The next resolution, um, as you know, the Ohio um, EPA has awarded Medina County up to $150,000 in grant money. This is for the replacement of residential septic systems to qualifying uh, low to moderate income households. Uh, this resolution is authorizing sanitary engineer to commence advertising for bids, and this is the, the replacement of these systems. The next resolution is declaring it uh, necessary to replace an existing water main and sanitary sooner later laterals uh, located in Chippewa Lake Village and authorizing sanitary engineer to enter into an agreement with engineering associates. This is for the professional design services in amount not to exceed uh, $4,310. The fourth resolution um, is approving the water improvement project, uh, Medina uh, Road. Uh, 
Uh, this is in cooperation with the OWDA uh, under the provisions and terms and conditions of the, of the agreement attached and authorizes the president of the board to approve this agreement. Um, the loan amount is, so the max amount is $663,865. And the final resolution is authorizing a cooperative agreement between the County of Medina and the Ohio Water Development Authority for the 8730 building renovation project at the Medina County Solid Waste Management District with the OWDA max loan amount of $789,755. I move to approve the five resolutions. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any questions? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Debbie Kiley. There she is. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning. Uh, just one resolution for your consideration. It's uh, an agreement between the Medina County Child Support Enforcement Agency and the Medina County Domestic Relations Court uh, for the enforcement of child support. This is for a period of time of January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, next up is Denise Testa, our Planning Services Director. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. I just have one um, resolution for your consideration um, for a contract for administrative services for program year 21 for our CHIP program between our county and the Ohio Regional Development Corporation. I move to approve. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any questions? Roll call. Family? Yes. Swinnick? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Okay. Thank Thanks you very Denise. much. There she is. Next up, we have Kyle White from our OSU Extension Office. And you're up. Good morning, Kyle. Howdy. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Um, long time no see. Um, long time no see anybody, right? Yeah. Um, but um, I'm actually here. Um, I have two colleagues that um, Rachel Chapman, I would like to introduce. Um, she is our 4 H program assistant. And Rachel's going to be talking a little bit about a program she's been doing. I wanted to make sure you were aware of. At the same time, we have a brand new 4 H educator. So, Sierra Baca has been hired at, uh, to replace Morgan Demokas. She started in February. Um, and we are very proud to have her and Rachel working on this program. We couldn't have two better people. So Rachel, do you want to talk a little bit about car teens? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. So uh, like she said, my name is Rachel Chapman, and I am our program assistant, uh, and I work primarily uh, with our 4-H program. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about our car teens program. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, with car teens at all. Um, okay, that's fine. So I brought um, some some papers there, um, uh, a little flyer I put together, just kind of uh, tell you a little bit about the program, and then. Um, so what it is is a juvenile traffic safety program uh, that focuses on first-time traffic offenders um, within Medina County. So this is a statewide program. It was started in 19, uh, yeah, 1987. And... Um, it has expanded to cover all across the state. So the reason that we do this program is because uh, traffic uh, accidents are the number one cause of death for teenagers between the ages of 15 and 19. Um, a person who is 20 years old um, has a significantly uh, reduced chance of dying in a car accident compared to someone who is younger. So it is a, a big concern all across the, the nation, not just here in Medina County. Um, but uh, one of the ways that we are trying to address this problem is by teaching uh, this car teens program. So um, what uh, what happens in the program is um, the court. So we have a, we have a partnership with our Medina County Juvenile Court System, with the State Highway Patrol System, and. Um, again with uh, with us in 4-H and so the juvenile court recommends uh, students to our class um, who are first-time uh, traffic offenders uh, and then they uh, they uh, it is a voluntary class so they choose to sign up for that two-hour class to come in and learn more about the program so uh, car teens is actually an acronym it stands for caution and responsibility and then teens refers to our uh, teenage uh, drivers and to um, the uh, teen um, youth who volunteer with the program throughout the state. So um, 
the so we focus a lot in this course on um, on promoting caution, um, promoting uh, crit like critical thinking when you're driving, and about the um, very uh, important decisions that youth have to make when they're driving. Um, because as I point out to them in the class, you know we make a lot of choices all throughout our daily lives, but when we're behind the wheel of a car, suddenly every choice that we make becomes extremely important. So. We go over a lot of information uh, in the course, um, again, just to kind of make sure that they, they know um, the right things to, to be doing on the road and that they're following uh, all of the traffic laws. But then we, uh, what I think is really special about the class is that we focus a lot on uh, the connections and uh, on open discussion and really getting kids to think about not just you know what are the laws, but why are those laws there? so that um, they can understand the importance of uh, the decisions that they're making when they're behind the wheel of a car to protect themselves and the community at large. And um, I've been teaching this class since I took over this position um, in January of last year, and we've had some really positive results. We've had uh, you know, some big changes that we faced in the class uh, because um, obviously COVID happened in the middle of there, so we've transitioned from doing an in-person class where there was a lot of like physical activities to um, an online class where we do a lot more group discussion and um, like thought-provoking exercises and things like that. Um, we've received very positive feedback, which I mentioned some of that on your form there. Um, 96% uh, of kids who complete the class can identify a positive safety change that they will make um, as a result of taking the class. 96% say that they learn new information. Uh, and a third of the class say they learned a lot of new information. So. Um, and then there's some testimonials too that um, you can read there of uh, just uh, things that you know kids have have said on their surveys that I think really speak a lot to um, what we're doing in this class. So uh, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing in our car teens program, and I really want to thank you, um, the the county commissioners, for supporting the work that we do at OSU Extension. Uh, this is just one of the um, wonderful things that we're doing as part of our work. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I was gonna yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, is this part, do you have hands on? This is the primarily just classroom and of course Zoom, or do you get hands on like the driving over by the pad behind the career center? And so this is not a, a driving based course. I know there are some fantastic um, driving based courses that they do also offer in Medina County. Like I said, this one is more. Um, it, it is uh, primarily over Zoom. Normally, we would have, you know, like physical activities that we do, um, and hopefully, we'll get to do again soon. <laughs> Yes, that was my question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. are, are, because the Kerr Center has that huge yes. driving pad, mm -hmm. and uh, it, and I know the uh, juvenile and probate court is involved with mm -hmm. that yeah, program yeah. over there. It yep. might be a control. nice way yeah. to integrate. Mm -hmm. yeah. It'd be nice if we get teenagers who have never had a traffic incident to take it too. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like a preemptive. Yes, and that's definitely something that we've talked about and something we'd really would like to work on for the future. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one thing that I mm -hmm. think might really strike you guys, it struck me, because I feel um, that, um, well, my understanding is um, back in the old days when I took driving, you know, mm -hmm. it was pretty involved driver's ed. In fact, the girl that would have been the, the um, valedictorian of my class got a C in driver's ed, and she wasn't the valedictorian of the class, so she was an excellent student, but a rotten driver. <laughs> but anyway, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to share one of the things that I learned when I first was understanding car teams was that they were talking about things like tailgating mm -hmm. and talking mm -hmm. about why you leave a certain number of car lengths between mm -hmm. vehicles when you're driving and what happens when you're texting and you're not paying mm -hmm. attention. And I learned that a lot of kids, um, I, I was talking to the instructor that was the predecessor for Rachel, but I don't, I take my foot off the gas when someone's tailgating me, hoping they'll back off. And she said, if they don't see taillights, they're not paying attention and they'll run into you. Mm -hmm. So these are things they mm -hmm. talk about in the class that the kids never thought of before. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, not everybody puts on their taillights when they just take their foot off the gas because they're feeling. So these, these are things that the kids really appreciate hearing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very valuable information. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. right. Well, thank you, Rachel. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you for your time. time. It was nice to meet you.
Yeah, and I just want to introduce myself. I'm Sierra. I'm the new 4-H educator. Um, we're working on 4-H camps as much as we can do this year. We will provide something. We're not sure what it's going to be. Um, and we're working on county fair right now, so we're excited for that. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. We appreciate you coming in today. Uh, so we will move on to our uh, commissioner resolutions. Um, I have two resolutions. Jamie's going to read the nomination. Oh, okay. Thank you. I do, do remember you telling me that. <laughs> Amy. Amy. Are we ready? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to read this with Jeremy out this week. So what Good I. Good morning, David. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So what I have is a resolution commending David Bazilovich for his 30 years of service with Medina County. Whereas it has come to the attention of the Board of County Commissioners that David Bazilovich is retiring from the Medina County Sanitary Engineering Department on April 1st, 2021. And whereas Dave was hired on July 9th, 1990 as a wastewater treatment plant supervisor at the Kenneth W. Holtz Water Reclamation Facility, also known as the Liverpool Wastewater Treatment Plant, Having previously obtained his class one, class two, and class three wastewater operator licenses, and sub subsequently achieved his class four wastewater operator license in January of 2003. Dave also built upon his existing class one water supply licensure by obtaining his class two and class three water supply licenses during his tenure with the county. And whereas Dave's experience, hard work, and dedication led to his promotion to be the assistant treatment plant superintendent of the Hinkley wastewater treatment plant in April 1998 and advanced him eight months later into the role of treatment plant superintendent of the Hinkley wastewater treatment plant in December 1998. In 2011, Dave continued advancing his career by promoting into a newly created superintendent of treatment position with responsibility and direct supervision over operations and the employees of the water division and the treatment plant superintendents of the Chippewa Wastewater Treatment Plant, Hinkley Wastewater Treatment Plant, and a Kenneth W. Holtz Water Reclamation Facility. And whereas Dave has consistently demonstrated highly effective leadership skills and ensured that all employees were treated fairly. As a trusted leader, Dave earned the respect of his staff and always led by example. He demonstrated a strength in employee development and cross-training to allow for continued professional growth and opportunities offered to others. He exemplified strong leadership in the design and completion of the $35 million cost efficiency improvement project at the Kenneth W. Holtz Water Reclamation Facility in 2019. He was also very cost conscious and ensured that projects and operational expenditures stayed within their annual approved budgets. And whereas Dave has an unmatched understanding of the county's water and wastewater treatment facilities and the criticality of their operations. Dave's work within Medina County is greatly appreciated and his presence will be missed by all of his coworkers and everyone who had the pleasure of working with Dave. And whereas the Board of County Commissioners wishes to recognize and honor Dave for his commitment and diligent work during his career. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Commissioners of Medina County, Ohio, that David Bazilovich be and is hereby commended for his 30 years of service with the Medina County Sanitary Engineering Department, and be it further resolved that this board wishes to take the opportunity to offer best wishes to Dave for his retirement. Motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, David, and thank you for your, your service. Oh, it's been Th wonderful. 30 years is a long time, and I know yeah, when, yeah. When, when I have been out to the, uh, the Kent Holtz Wastewater Treatment Plant and did the tour, and, and very much appreciated. And, and I, uh, I really like the, the digester and, and that whole project. Uh, it sounds like uh, Jeremy gave us some figures, I think, last uh, week or the week before, and it sounds like it's doing really well. So. It is doing well. And we awesome. anticipate doing better. You know, it's a learning curve for all the staff and as a group, you know, um, you know, they, they, uh, they perform very well. So I think it's uh, moving forward is going to be fantastic. Yes, indeed. I think so, all your hard work of 30 years uh, kept you looking young. It had yeah. something to do with the... Uh, <laughs> 
either either that or you started when you were in high school. I did. Yeah. Okay. I well, did. then. There you go. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, 1974. Oh my I started God. As a treatment plant operator outside of the county. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Roll call, please. Emily. Yes. Sweated. Yes. Sensen. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Dave. You. And we have a, a certificate here for you. I'll uh, put my mask on. We'll hand it to you at an arm's length. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Photo. All right. I was smiling. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. David, Appreciate congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, one other resolution uh, reappointing and appointing members to the Manana County Advisory Council on Aging and Disability. Uh, we are uh, reappointing Jackie Smith, Bill Meyer, Linda Williams, and Marie Edmonds and appointing Diana Madonna to a uh, new term. Move to approve. Second. Got a roll call and second. Any questions? Just the thank, thanking them for uh, their, their service. service. is all yes, voluntary. Uh, this obviously helps uh, the county quite a bit in terms of identifying programs and working with uh, Laura Toth over there, So, as well as represent on the uh, Five County Advisory Council. Roll call, please. Emily? Yes. Sweater? Yes. Hudson? Yes. And uh, we'll move on to our guest. Uh, we have Tom Jenkins and Hub Marcus um, up for the SBCA. <laughs> kind of hard to recognize you all with your mask on. <laughs> yeah, Tom always moves aside to let me, uh, you know, come up here. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we we came to thank you again very much for your support for the SBCA and and for the for the monies. Um, uh, since we've moved down to Guilford Road, it has gone very well. Um, uh, things are moving along, um, and uh, your support is, is greatly appreciated. Um, I think uh, we've settled down to the point where uh, uh, the society is, is uh, I think, doing things the way they should be done. Uh, we have a, a very good uh, person. Uh, taking care of the day-to-day -day operations and and uh, we can say hopefully spending spending the money wisely and um, so um, anyhow we we've, we've um, it every year the uh, amount of animals continue to increase uh, we were up to about um, 1700 uh, total intake last year um, and I can say that um, part of that was the city of Medina had a, a little uh, house full of rats uh, which was about 300 of them the, between uh, the SPCA and the city themselves. We were able to, to clear that out and get that, that taken care of. This lady was raising rats. And, um, uh, and then the one other, I think, number would be the fact that uh, over a thousand cats, um, and I don't want to get into what I just went through with the, uh, the city, but uh, the, uh, the, the cat population continues uh, to be as it is, and, and we had that kind of turned over a few years ago, um, you know, uh, when we when we uh, uh, worked with the county on that. Anyhow, it's um, it's going well. You know, we start out with the whole, whole you know cat season starts what Tom in like uh, probably May and runs yeah runs uh, through um, uh, probably October. And uh, amazingly, you know, we could be up to 250, 300 cats in the facility at one time, and then by the end of the year, um, uh, they're 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 adopted out. And I just I wonder every year where in the world do all these animals go? But they find good homes, and and that's good. So, uh, that's so it. Hub, your your deal with uh, SPCA deals with um, domesticated cats. Pretty much, um, pretty much. Is there any program for feral cats? <laughs> Tom said, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Just a question. No, I, um, basically, um, if we get a feral cat, um, if we can, if, if, let's put it, uh, let me expand that to say a pregnant feral cat, 
we hope we can get it soon enough because if you can get it soon enough, you can domesticate, you know, the kittens. The cat itself, no, you know, and so uh, the, you know, the trap, neuter, and release, you know, program as, as it exists is very expensive. Uh, we, we have chosen not to be that and when we, when we uh, did the, the, the gas chamber many years ago, we said we really were not going to get into the, the, into that business because it's just, it's, it's just so hard to set up and try to, uh, you know, financially responsible, try to, uh, you know, to operate that, that program. Because first of all, it's trapping them and that can, you can, you could set a trap, but you know, you could catch anything. Mm -hmm. And it goes over and over until finally you get what you're trying to aim for. And then you've got to neuter them. And then releasing them is even more difficult because the people don't want them back to where they were. Right. So um, um, it, it, I can't say that it is not a problem because it, it is a problem in Medina County, but not a, I don't think it's a huge problem. But it, it, it does exist. And of course, you have a lot of people that you know, just don't want to see any cat put down. And, and we understand that, but that's, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's not much you can do with a, with a, uh, an adult feral. So uh, I'm not answering it uh, probably. I understand. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, I think that uh, what, what, you know, that expands quickly into the deer problem. Right. And, yeah. well, you know, people get into that deer problem. It's, it's um, uh, yeah, Medina yeah. City is, is uh, trying to work on that. Oh, yes, they are. Yes, they are. I had yeah. 18. I should have taken a picture, but I had 18 in my backyard mm -hmm. yesterday afternoon. Yeah. And enjoying the grass, thank goodness. Yeah. Just the grass. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> this time of year. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yes. I do have so, a question if you've got the sure. time. Just um, as you know, um, well, House Bill 24, which is the, the bill I authored, was uh, passed by the General Assembly and, the, uh, and signed by the governor in December. It will be going in effect in April. One of the provisions of that does require the Humane Society uh, to provide an annual enforcement report filed with the sheriff. Mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful to the board. I know you're pretty sure you're going to be coming back at the end of the year asking for additional funds next year to potentially to, uh, you know, take a look at that report and, and add all those other activities. I think it would be helpful to the commissioners to also sure. have an understanding of that, what the Humane Officer as well as the, you know, the prosecution and all these other uh, activities, uh, sure. aside from all the, uh, if you will, uh, all, all the all the rescues that you're that you're getting, sure. would be very helpful for us in evaluating those uh, those requests. Okay. All right. We'll take a. Uh, could you forward me on to that? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the uh, I'll send you the uh, the enacted version enrolled. Uh, and if you have any questions, please you know give me. Yeah, a, I mean just uh, there's a lot of I, nuances I, to it. Uh, additions. Uh, it's aren't there always right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it originally was a three page bill, and after six years, it gained quite a bit. So okay. Up, uh, uh, no, I'd, I'd appreciate that. And sure. That way, okay. it would give our people a chance to you know at least that you know, uh, make sure they're collecting the right data. Right, right. And you don't have an executive director now, do we you? We do not. And we, yeah. we basically have, have uh, uh, you're aware, you know, we've tried. It, uh, COVID kind of took care of right. that. Um, um, so we will take a look at it when we feel that financially we can support right. something like that. Right. So, uh, um, and I don't know, uh, well, well, we'll just have to wait and see what, what happens well, be, with that. Be glad to pass the information on to you and answer I, any questions. As I said, help us whenever you make your funding request is the, the various activities. Sure, appreciate which that. Which are not just the rescues, but also ends up being the enforcement part. Right, exactly. So, all right, mm -hmm. very good. Thank well, you. thanks again thank very, you. very much. Tom, thank you. All right. And thanks for all the SPCA does and well, protecting animals. Anytime we can help, uh, and, and I think we've had a good working relationship with Scott and, and Dell. And we we've hopefully improved that. So, uh, yeah, uh, so thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you both. All right. Okay, uh, Steve, could I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss imminent court action? And we'll do that after discussion. Sure, I'd like to move to go into executive session for the imminent court discussion, court action. Second. Roll call. Hamley. Yes. Sweater. Yes. Hudson. Yes. Um, and now we'll go into discussion session. Oh, Steve, okay. I, yeah, I just something. had the one item was support for House Bill 206. Uh, this involves uh, township uh, police officers on interstate. Uh, the issue dates back to a decision back in the slip decision by the Supreme Court in 2015, uh, State of Ohio v. Brown, which actually eliminated the authority of township police uh, arrest authority uh, for uh, traffic violations in not only interstates, but also all state, all federally funded state highways. 
Uh, there was a case that rose up in uh, Medina County and OVI on the Route 18 uh, that Montville um, ended up, uh, and uh, uh, Steve McElvain was forced to dismiss it. And so hence it came to us, uh, we were able to work out some compromise, but we could only get the state highways, and then the interstate remained as, as an issue for many. And this, is a, uh, this in involves just the arrest authority of uh, township police officers in townships under 50,000 or more than 5,000 uh, to provide, uh, uh, provide that authority. It has to be approved by the township trustees. Um, that have that. And likewise, uh, fully clear, I think, to reemphasize that the fines collected from any kind of speeding ticket or, or moving violation uh, issued by the, by the township officer on that interstate highway would continue to go to the county treasury for highway maintenance. Uh, so that way it kind of avoids any kind of, uh, it's a safeguard against uh, what Mike suggests are unwarranted speed traps solely for monetary purposes. The only reason they're up there is for enforcement purposes. And it really does, and I, our, our drug task force endorsed this bill last GA, as well as the prior, uh, Mayor Hanwell, Pat Geisman had written a letter that I, I, I shared with you, and this is an update to that, and hopefully we can move it, move it through. The Sheriff's Association had been in opposition. They moved uh, to not opposing it um, because they, um, uh, uh, with an agreement that it could only include townships that have interstate uh, uh, interchanges within the township. So the, in Brunswick Hills, since they don't have in interchange, they would not uh, be able to go on the on the right. the, the interstate. But they get called up all the time, as so does you know. We found in testimony, uh, Copley police uh, uh, would get township would get called up on 21, and the state highway patrol is 40 minutes away. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do anything. They had no arrest authority, and so this is for you know traffic for for drug interdiction, for human trafficking, for sex trafficking, all these kind of things. They're used by the other law enforcement agencies and needed to help patrol and help help keep an eye on. So this is really a, about public safety. Do you think we need a formal letter of support or just contacting our state reps? Well, our state reps knows this, but I, this formal letter of support that I prepared, yeah. uh, Terry Grice is likewise going to be signing it because he was the <laughs> chief of police in Montville that brought it to our attention uh, 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 years ago. So, and he continues to support it. Um, I, I'll, I'll just say that, uh, you know, obviously it's not everything that, that Terry would have lined it or what I like, but it certainly, it, it makes some sense to obviously to help, help support it. There, there's going to be a harder time in the Senate, I think, uh, to, to kind of work through some of the issues. Uh, the Senate president voted against it last General Assembly, why it didn't make out. So uh, they've, they've got a high threshold. So I think yeah. coming early in will help us uh, uh, help get it out of the House. It passed the House. So at this point, it's just a matter of getting it out of the House and having enough that it can basically be worked, worked out through the Senate. It's I'm sensible. Good, good the populations yeah. are interesting, but well, <laughs> limitate. Yeah, it was so more of a political decision, and there was the understand whether well, somebody said a township could become a municipality of five thousand population if they want to, in which case they would have home rule mm -hmm. and right. could be on yeah, the interstate. Yeah, mm -hmm. So that's right. why five thousand was said. Okay, that's good enough. We'll yeah. <laughs> do it that way. So it did, like I said, the uh, it, believe it or not, the uh, issue that emerged in other areas had to do with. Uh, we'll just say the confiscation of drugs and uh, the funds derived from that. Many of the sheriffs in other parts of the state liked uh, those confiscations. Uh, and we have a drug task force. It gets shared when there are drugs, uh, right? And we know that we've got it. Other states didn't have that, so there were a number of sheriffs that didn't quite like the idea of uh, potentially sharing some of those resources with <laughs> to forfeitures yeah. to township police. Mm -hmm. And it was about money, unfortunately, yeah. for some of them. But that, that's changed. Sheriff Miller had always been in, in favor of this, and now Sheriff Grice is likewise. Good. Very good. Anything okay. else, Steve? Nope, that's it. Ellen, Scott. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you real quick. Um, as you may know, Columbia Gas uh, Transmission increased the transportation costs for natural gas. Um, Voluntary Energy, who is the provider of natural gas for the county aggregation program, uh, passed through this charge of seven uh, seven point one four five cents uh, per CCF. Um, there's also a polar vortex charge that they charged for the month of March. Um, they took a mil ten million dollar hit uh, because of the polar vortex. So, based on the agreement that we have with Volunteer Energy, and based on the information that um, the agreements that they have with the residents in the aggregation program, we didn't feel that it was fair for them to 
impose these charges without giving residents an option. So last week, uh, Mike Lyons and I, <clears throat> uh, Kevin Lottergan with uh, Community Energy Advisors, uh, met with the PUCO and with Volunteer Energy. They came to a compromise where they will be refunding the polar vortex charge to our residents. Uh, that was charged, it was about nine cents, so if you had 100 CCF, it'd be, what, about nine dollars, I guess, um, to, to, uh, to the residents. And for the um, transportation charge, uh, they made it easier for the residents to opt out. But what's gonna happen is a resident, they're gonna get a letter from Volunteer Energy, they'll have the option to opt out. If they opt out of the, of the aggregation program, uh, they will then get refunded for the transportation charges that they were billed in February and in March. Um, then they'll have the option to, to um, get back into the program. But basically what we did was, is um, the way that the residents can opt out is within the letter there's gonna be a form that they can either, they can fill out the form and send it in. There's a phone number that they can call to opt out. Um, or they can go to the website and they can opt out that way. Um, if they do opt out, they'll go to the um, SCO rate, um, which is 17 cents per CCF. Um, if they stay in the program and don't opt out, it's 16.7 cents per CCF. So just wanted to let you know that, um, that we did talk to them, that the residents can expect a refund of the of polar vortex charge, and they do have the option of opting out um, and getting refunded for the uh, TCO charge. Um, we figure it's gonna be somewhere about $20 if they opt out, $20 refunded um, to the residents. For Volunteer Energy, it's like 180,000 uh, per month. So it's a substantial amount for them. So, so this, the, oh, sorry. Um, is, is the transportation charge and the polar vortex charge only for two months? No, no. Per, per the agreement that we had with um, Volunteer Energy and per the agreement that they had with the residents, it went to March 31st and April 1st, we felt that it, it was absolutely, um, that Volunteer Energy had the ability to, to charge that, but not before April 1st because the agreement said that guaranteed a rate from through March 31st. Um, or the polar vortex charge, yeah, it was just one month. So they sold more gas, generated more revenue, and then they wanted smack you with a polar vortex charge, well, huh? Well, yeah, well, what, what happened was, as I understand it, <clears throat> is they, they've got, you know, these contracts in place and for a certain amount of gas. Well, when the polar vortex hit, the gas usage went up, so they had to purchase additional gas at a higher cost than what they, that, what they had. So they took, they took a major hit, uh, that $10 million hit um, in March. Is that what happened? Uh, is that everything to do with happened in Texas? I believe so, yes. And so basically it was a cascading effect yes. in terms of the contracts yeah. and the increased mm -hmm. cost on that. Yeah. Which is actually part of the risk of them you know, it's part of the, quoting. I, I know. It is, it is, uh, which, which, which is one of the reasons why yeah. um, they, they, you know, in talking to them, they felt that they, they would go ahead and refund the, uh, well, the, the yeah. polar vortex yeah. charge. Yeah. yeah. It seems to be a business risk, they assumed, when they yeah. struck the deal. I, yes. would, I would think so. It's part of the contract. Right. Yeah. Indeed. So, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. All right. So, right, thank, thank you. Anything else, Scott? No. Nope. Rhonda, Denise? All right. Let's go into executive session and then we will return to formally adjourn. See you. Bye, Denise.
Okay, so 11.49, we are out of executive session. Move to adjourn. Second. Roll call, please. Hambly? Yes. Swedek? Yes. That's it. Yes. We're adjourned. See you all next week.